Galatians 2. And Lord, we just pray that you would open our hearts to your word, God. Lord, that, we, that you would open our hearts to your voice, Lord, your spirit speaking to us through your word. That, God, it would convict us and that you would speak to us, Lord, exactly what you want to say. God, I pray you would just use me as a vessel this morning, Lord, and that all of us together, Lord, would be hearing you, Lord, and growing closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll let the plane fly over. Galatians chapter 2. Now, you guys probably remember from last week a bit of the context that's going on here, but in case... You weren't here last week. I'll share a little bit of it for you. Paul is writing to the region of Galatia, to the churches that are there. And he's writing to confront this doctrine of legalism. This doctrine of legalism. In fact, Paul feels so strongly about this doctrine that I I would say it's okay to say that Paul views it as heresy. Paul, Paul views it as heresy because the doctrine of legalism says that faith plus something else equals salvation. Faith plus works, faith plus law, faith plus something else equals salvation. That's just religion. But Paul says no true faith says that faith plus nothing equals salvation because Christ has made up the difference. It's not up to me to make up the difference to my faith. That's what Christ did on the cross. I just have to put my faith in what Christ has done on my behalf. That is salvation. And anytime you try to add something to that, you actually take away from the gospel. And anytime you try to supplement salvation through faith alone, we actually supplant it. That's Paul's argument. You may think that legalism and religiosity would draw you closer to God, but actually it just leads you further astray. That's the danger with legalism. It makes you feel like with these rituals and these ceremonies and these good works that I'm doing that surely I'm drawing nearer to God, but it's not the case. And if you're not careful, legalism will not only deceive you, but it will lead you to start deceiving others as well. That's the danger of adding anything to our faith. In fact, I shared last week, I think that's the true litmus test to a Christian church, is what is the gospel message that they preach. Salvation is through faith in Christ alone. Because of who Jesus is, because of his death, because of his resurrected life. And any way we would vary from that is actually destructive. And I find this text, I find this little epistle so compelling to me. I've shared this quote with you guys before, but Martin Luther always said that he believed that man's natural bend was to return to works. And that's why I think that this epistle is so relevant and so powerful for the church even today. Is so often I just get into this weird spot where I feel like I have to start working for what I've already received. Have you ever been there? Anyone here ever been trapped in legalism at any point? Well, that's awesome. Some of you are just trapped in lying. Only four people raised their hands. (laughs) I'm teasing, but come on. All right, we we all struggle at some point with trying to go back, trying to earn, trying to work again for God's favor and God's grace. And Paul's argument to the church in Galatia is you can't do that. You have to stand fast on the doctrine of the gospel that you received at the beginning, that only through faith that God saves you, and only through faith does the Spirit of God work among you, not by what you bring to the table, but what God has done on your behalf. And so Paul is writing in the first chapter to not just lay down his argument, but also to confront the Judaizers. They're the main opponents. They are the adversaries of the church in this letter. They are the ones teaching the Gentiles that they have to become Jews first in order to become Christians. I mean, it makes sense. They show up after they got saved and they said, hey, look, here's a problem. Christianity actually started with us Jews. So if you want to be saved, you got to become a Jew first and then you can become a Christian. 
Well, that sounds like a good idea. What do I have to do? Well, first you got to get circumcised. That must have been weird. And then we have a whole stack of laws you need to keep, 613 to be precise, on top of ceremonies and rituals and not to forget the tradition of the elders. And so Paul is confronting these Judaizers, and he's been arguing about his apostleship and how it comes from the Lord, and he's also arguing about his message, how this gospel didn't come from man, but it came from Christ to him. And so Paul will continue that defense, but now he's going to move from the source of his gospel to the content of it. At first, he was defending where he got it from. I received this from Jesus Christ. And now he's defending the message of it by grace alone. Verse 1 of chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who have reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. And you may remember Paul's been talking to them about his visits to Jerusalem. Because no doubt the Judaizers were trying to supplant his work with the Galatian church, saying, well, Paul really just received his gospel from the church in Jerusalem, and that, well, that's where we're from. And Paul's been explaining to them that, no, no, I received this gospel from Christ. In fact, the other apostles didn't even teach it to me. If you remember last week, Paul said, after I got saved, I was in Arabia for three years before I finally went and saw Peter. And that was just like a visit, like he was touring the church. And now Paul says, another 14 years passed before the next time I went and saw the apostles. That's a long period. Guys, when we read the book of Acts, oftentimes we just see the story in a couple chapters. You know what I mean? It's like you, you look at a time period and you read it and, and you just think of it as all one great story. Like the book of Ezra, for instance. I'll give you an example. Did you know the book of Ezra, I think it spans a time period of 100 years. Did you know that? When you read the book of Ezra, it's only like, what, 10 chapters? You don't think 100 years just flew by. Same thing with the book of Acts. We read these stories and we talk about Paul got saved. Paul's preaching the gospel. Paul's on these mission trips. And we think it happened in three months. But Paul makes it clear 17 years has gone by at this point in his life. Three years right after he got saved and now 14 more years. For nine of those years, Paul was just in Tarsus making tents. Have you ever thought about that? The great apostle Paul. Nine years in the middle of, well, Christian obscurity, sharing the gospel with people, no doubt, but he's just a tent maker. And you go to the book of Acts, and in chapter 11 of Acts, Barnabas goes to Antioch, where the Gentiles are, and all these people are getting saved. And he shows up, and he's like, you know what this church needs? This church needs Paul. And Barnabas goes looking for Paul, who's still Saul at this point. And he finds him, and he brings him to the church, and Paul starts ministering to the church there. And then after some time, God would speak to Paul and say, Paul, now I want you to go abroad and share, and share the gospel with the Gentiles all over the world. But we don't think about the amount of time that went into that. Now, the reason I bring this up, guys, is because we live in a culture of instant gratification. We live in a culture of instant gratification. We feel like if I'm going to make it, I need to make it now. In fact, even in our business communities, there's this sense of I have to become an overnight success. Like I have to wake up today and do great things and be successful. And the reality about life and faith is it doesn't work that way. God used Paul to do tremendous, impactful things, and he did so over Paul's lifetime. He did so over Paul's lifetime. And there were many years that Paul was just, well, to us, we'd say it sounds like he's doing nothing. Sitting in Tarsus, making tents. Yeah, you know, all of that was part of God's plan. And I would just encourage you guys this morning to be faithful with the little things. I don't know about you, but I want to live a life of significance. I want to live a life that makes a difference. I think inside all of us, there's a desire to be like a Paul for God's kingdom. 
to see people get saved, to contend for the gospel, to share grace with God's people. And yet that life happens with a day-by-day, little-by-little faithful walk to Jesus Christ. That's how it happens. Paul was just faithful to say yes to Jesus as each day came. And there's a day coming not not too soon later from this story that he's talking about where the Lord's going to speak to him and Barnabas while they're fasting and saying, Paul, I'm setting you apart now to go do great things for the gospel. And for Paul, it was just another day of saying yes to Jesus. So Paul shares about this time going up to the church in Jerusalem. No doubt he says he went up by revelation, probably speaking of Acts chapter, I think it's 11, verse 27, where Agabus is a prophet, and he prophesies to the church leaders, to Paul and the others, that there's going to be this tremendous famine. And Paul and Barnabas and the church, the Gentile churches, they go, we want to support the people in Jerusalem who are going to suffer. And so they brought together a big collection and a big offering, and Paul and Barnabas delivered it to the church in Jerusalem. That's one of the that's one of the times this could have been. It could have also been the time that Barnabas and Paul showed up to talk with the church leaders about whether or not people should be circumcised who are saved. And I feel like that one also fits our context. It's hard to know which visit Paul's talking about. It could be either. But either way, Paul says he went up to the church in Jerusalem in the end of verse 2, but privately to those who have reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. So Paul's gone up to them, he's sharing with the Galatians to confer now with the religious, or not religious, but the church leaders in Jerusalem, the apostles, privately to share with them the gospel he was sharing with the Gentiles in order to say, to see what they would say about it, whether or not they felt like that the Gentiles needed to be compelled to also live under the law. But this is what Paul wrote. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, I'll just be honest with you guys because I already feel like I'm just stumbling over my words. I am super excited to be here with you all today. I am. But I'm also super nervous because this text is so theologically dense and rich because you have to understand the history of it. For us, we're just, this feels like background filler to the letter, but you have to understand that this is one of the more pivotal moments for the church Because remember, when the apostles started preaching the gospel, who did they preach it to? Jews only. Jews only. In fact, it took the Lord speaking to Peter in a special vision. Do you remember that story? Where this cloth came down from heaven three times. Jesus had to send Peter the same vision three times because Peter wouldn't get it. And had all the things that Peter had thought were unclean because he was a Jew. And and God would say, Peter, rise, kill and eat. And he'd say, no, Lord. Nothing unclean has touched my lips. And God would say, Peter, don't call unclean what I've made clean. And three times the Lord had to do that for Peter because it was such a struggle. And then after it happened, do you know what it said? It said Peter was up there still trying to figure it out. I wonder what the Lord's trying to say. That's how hard it was for them to get through this barrier. It's kind of racist, to be honest. They had some issues this barrier to actually reach out to the Gentiles and love them in the name of Jesus. It was hard. And while Peter's trying to figure out what God was obviously trying to say to him, some Gentiles show up at his door to look for him. And the Spirit of God says to Peter, Peter, I want you to go with them, and I want you to doubt nothing. Just go, Peter. And so Peter does, and while he's out with them, he comes to the house of Cornelius. And while he's at the house of Cornelius, the Spirit of God is poured out on the Gentiles. And they start speaking in tongues. And they're radically transformed just like the Jews were. And Peter and the people with them, they're shocked. They don't know what to do. Peter says, well, there's only one thing we can do at this point. Baptize them. And then he goes back home and guess what happens? The church has a big argument. You preach to Gentiles? I can't believe you did that. 
And the church leadership had to fight through this. It's hard for us to think of that, but that's what actually was going on. And finally, they came to the point where they were like, okay, I guess the scriptures say God was going to set up a way for all people to come to him, not just us Jews. But it was hard for them. You go back to Acts 15 when Paul shows up and tells the church what God is doing. It says the Pharisees, remember the Pharisees, the enemies of Jesus? Well, some of them got saved. And now they're part of the church. (laughs) Talk about it's hard to love your brothers and sisters sometimes. Be hard to love those guys. Paul and Barnabas show up and the Pharisees stand up and they're upset. These Gentile Christians, they need to get circumcised. They need to keep the law. And Paul and Barnabas and the leaders, this whole like fight breaks out. It says that there was dissension among them. They argued. That's how pivotal this moment was in church history. Because Paul, like he said right here in verse 5, he said, To whom we did not yield submission, even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul's like a bulldog for grace. In fact, if, you, if you're familiar with his early testimony, it's kind of funny. Remember it says he's disputing with the Hellenists and all this stuff? And the church finally sends him away to Tarsus, and then you know what it says? The church had peace and grew. Paul was a fiery, passionate guy. Paul could be abrasive at times, but you know what? God had raised Paul up for this moment. Because Paul was going to be the one in the argument who says, absolutely not. We will not tell these people they have to keep a law that none of us could ever fill. And so this incredible conversation happens. And in Acts 15, the church leaders finally, once and for all, sit down and say, you know what? People are saved by grace alone. And we're not going to require Gentile believers to keep the 613 commandments of Moses and get circumcised and do all these other things. And they wrote a letter to the churches with what they did expect from them. And that was a great victory for the church. And you and I, we miss it in these little verses. But a pivotal moment in church history And Paul is reminding these Judaizers of that decision. When he says, I brought Titus with me to see if the leaders of Jerusalem would say Titus should get circumcised, but they didn't. In fact, it was the opposite. The leaders of Jerusalem would also say, you know what? We're saved by grace through faith alone. So Paul goes on to say, but from those who seem to be something... Whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. Now, I love this because Paul is actually talking about the religious, or not, I keep saying religious leaders. I gotta stop that. The apostles. He's talking about the apostles when he says that. That those who seem to be something, whatever they were, you get the idea that Paul's kind of fiery, don't you? He goes, Peter, James, and John, I wasn't impressed. Now for us, we're like, what are you talking about? I mean, we've all heard the stories. Peter's shadow falling on people, people getting healed. We would all be like, ah. He's like, yeah, he walked on water, but he also still wears deodorant. He's just a man. And this is the key to what Paul is saying here. Look what he said. Whatever they were, to it, whatever they were it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. This is Paul in some ways reiterating his earlier thought from chapter one where he says, I don't live to please man, I live to please God. And that's why Paul could go to the Jerusalem council and be so bold. This wasn't about impressing the other apostles. Paul knew they were all just men. He said, this is about doing the will of God. And because of that, Paul could be just as bold and as confident as he wanted to be. Guys, and I read this about Paul's life and I go, I long for that kind of confidence too. Do you long for that kind of confidence? Let me tell you, it comes from fearing God and not fearing man. Paul wasn't being disrespectful to these other leaders. Paul had great respect for them. But Paul also knew that they were just men, just like he was. And what God wants from men like you and me is that we would live a life in order to please him. So Paul says, God shows no partiality. God uses me just like he uses them. 
For, to no man, for those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So contrary to popular opinion going on in Galatia, where the Judaizers were saying, you know what, Paul needs to be further instructed. Paul said, no. I went to Jerusalem. I had the conversation. If this letter is talking about Acts 15, Paul said, I was there. I was there when the decision was made. And in fact, the leaders of Jerusalem, they didn't add anything onto my gospel. They didn't say, Paul, you're a little confused. They actually just looked at me and said, Paul, you're right on. And they gave Paul the right hand of fellowship. That means they looked at Paul as an equal. And they recognized a couple things about Paul. And I want you to notice this because I think it's important. Paul says right here, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. Now, they're not talking about two separate gospel messages, by the way. They're not. What they're talking about is calling. What Paul is saying is the leaders in Jerusalem, they saw Paul's calling. They recognized that Jesus had touched Paul and anointed Paul and set Paul apart to do something totally different from what they were doing. And so because of that, they just said yes and amen to what God was doing in Paul and offered him companionship in it. They also saw something else, look what it says. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles, and I'll get to that. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me. The second thing the, the, the apostle saw on Paul's life was God's grace. They could see it. God's favor. God's ability. The Spirit of God working through Paul. They saw it. And all of that moved them to come alongside Paul in partnership. Now, the reason I bring this up to you is because Paul is trying to make an argument for the sake of the Galatian church, and I think it's good for you and I too, that he wasn't picked by man. It's not like Peter was walking down the line one day and he was like, Paul, follow me. And he taught Paul how to be an apostle and he called Paul to be an apostle and he taught Paul all these wonderful things. That didn't happen. He didn't have an Elijah moment. Remember Elisha? When Elijah walks by him and throws his mantle on him? And Elijah chooses and calls Elisha to take up the mantle and learn from him. Paul didn't have that. Do you know what Paul had? He had a calling from God. He had a a burning passion in his heart and a calling from God. He had a moment in his life where God spoke to him and said, Paul, I want you to do this. And Paul didn't wait for anyone else to tell him it was okay. He just started doing it. Guys, I think that is a tremendous word for God's church. Because I believe that you and I have unique callings from the Lord. Differing from one another. I believe that. I believe that the Lord Jesus wants to anoint you and I for different services and different acts. But so often in our life, you and I are waiting for someone else to come to us and tell us it's okay. But Paul is an example. If Jesus tells you to do something, you just need to start doing it. That's the truth. You just need to start doing it. Maybe it's been on your heart to start a little Bible study and get some friends together and read the word. And you're like, well, I can't do that until someone from the church, an elder, comes and says, I had a vision. You were leading a Bible study. You should do it. Now, that would be awesome, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Maybe it will. 
I think what is better is if God has put on your heart to start a little Bible study with some friends that you step out in faith and do it. And let the leaders of the church come alongside of you and say, yes and amen. When I was a young pastor, and I'm still a young pastor, okay, I admit that, but I was once an even younger pastor, okay? (laughs) One time I was really young, all right? Hey, at least you didn't have to put up with that version of me, all right? I'll talk about that version of me later. Okay, my senior pastor taught me, though. He said, Cody, he said, you don't call people to do things in the church, like be an elder. He goes, you don't, in fact, that's what he was teaching me, was how to pick elders in the church. He said, Cody, you don't just go out and pick elders in the church. You come alongside those who are already doing the work. And you just affirm what God's already doing in them. I think that's incredible wisdom. Guys, if God is calling you to do something, don't wait for someone else to tell you to do it. The most important person in the universe has already given you permission. What is your church leader supposed to do? Argue with Jesus? That's Paul's argument here with the Judaizers. He's like, if you have a problem with my calling, with my message, then take it up with the Lord. Because that's where I received it. And even the leaders in the church, they had to say yes and amen because it was Christ. If God has called you to do something, you need to step out in that grace and let the Lord use you. And others will see it too. So whatever that is. In fact, God's been reminding me. I was driving here this morning. God's like, Cody, there's things I put on your heart to do. And the reason I haven't done them yet is because I'm waiting for someone else to tell me it's a good idea. And the Lord's reminding me, Cody, you have a calling on your life. You have to step out and do what I tell you to do. And that's true of Paul, it's true of me, it's true of you. It's true of the person sitting next to you. Look at the person sitting next to you and say, just do it. If Jesus told you to do it. Add that on at the end, okay? (laughs) Guys, you and I need to step out in the anointing and in the calling. And you know what? This is a powerful powerful thought for me, and I've, I've actually been wrestling on it because I think it's also a good balance for you and I when we think God's called us to do something and we're not sure. Because if God's called you to do something, his grace and his spirit is going to make it plain. So don't be afraid just to step out and give it a try. In fact, I love what Paul wrote here in verse 7 or verse 8, sorry. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. Peter and Paul both knew where their wild ministry success came from. And when I say wild ministry success, what am I talking about? I mean, Peter got up and gave like a really bold statement. He's like, you killed Jesus. And 3,000 people got saved. <laughs> okay, that is the spirit of God working. Paul would go to all these pagans and share the gospel with them, and they would even sacrifice to him. They would think Paul was a god. Paul's like ripping his clothes, like, what's the matter with you guys? And you know what? People's hearts would be torn, and they would get saved. It was the Spirit of God. Paul and Peter both recognized that it was the Spirit of God who was working in them. Guys, this this gives so much confidence to you and me. If God has anointed you for something, if God's called you to it, if his grace is with you, you need to step out. You might go, oh, woe is little me. What could I do? Nothing. Really, in your own strength, you can't do anything. But in Jesus Christ, you can do many things, if not all things. In fact, that's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's the Spirit of God who's going to work through you. This is why I love so much about this little epistle, is when we go through the Gospels, it's very much oriented towards those who are seeking. You know what I mean? We're talking about Jesus and do you know Jesus? But when Paul wrote this little letter, he was writing to the church. He was writing to people like you and I saying, hey, you better get up and get in shape here. God's grace is too big for you just to sit on your blessed assurance, Pastor Mark would say. Those are his words. I have it recorded. I can show you later. It's It's true. God's grace is too good for you to sit on the side and not do anything. God's grace is also too good for you to go back to legalism. And that's what this next part is about. Verse 10, they desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I was also eager to do. And by the way, we're going to talk about this more on a different day, but Paul was so adamant about the church being generous, so adamant. He would 
He'd write letters to them. Be like, no, don't forget to set aside your generous gift for us to bless others with. And as a church, I gotta tell you, I sense God's call. For the last couple years, I've sensed God's call strongly that we're to be the generous church in Southern Oregon. We're to be the church that goes to the park and cleans it up. We're to be the church that goes to someone's house and restores it. We're to be the church that comes alongside of other churches that have less resources and provide help where they need it. We're the church called to minister to the larger church abroad. I gotta tell you guys, we came back from the pastor's conference and I emailed I emailed the, the senior pastor who was overseeing that huge conference and all these senior, other senior pastors came. And I said, hey, I said, I don't mean to be weird. And I'm not trying to pry into anyone's personal business. But if you could send me a list of all the names of all the senior pastors who came, that would be awesome. And every Sunday, our leaders and volunteers and people who are here early, we get together and we pray for our church, but we also take one name at random out of that list. And we pray for their church as well. Why do we do that? Because God has called you and I to be the giving church. That's our calling too. And so Paul's heart, and like I said, we'll talk about it on, in a different message. He's moved though that they would be eager to give, eager to serve. Verse 11, now I love this story. And it's actually where the title of our message comes from. It's called In Your Grace. Because Paul is going to get in the grace and the face of Peter. And this is one of those moments where two great church leaders are going to butt heads. And this is the story, verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, so now Peter's come to Paul's church. Paul's gone to Jerusalem to visit, but now Peter's come to Paul's church. I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all. Now pause. This is such a cool story. It shows that the church always had problems. You go way back. Church leaders disagree. But what's happened here is Peter has come to visit the Gentile church. And Paul and Barnabas, they're part of this thriving church in Antioch where Jews and Gentiles are living in harmony and enjoying the grace of God. It's a beautiful place. In fact, God used Antioch to launch the mission field for the Gentiles. That's where Paul and Barnabas were when they were praying and fasting. It was Antioch with the leaders of those churches. And they said, hey, we got to separate you. God's calling you to go forth and share the gospel. And also at Antioch, it was the first place that believers were called Christians. That's what the Bible says. The title Christian, it started in this church. What a cool church, huh? And so Peter's come to Antioch and he's hanging out with them and he's just enjoying the grace of God. He's sitting with the Gentiles and they're eating together like they're family. And this is a big deal because the Jews had all these dietary laws, kosher restrictions. They weren't able to eat certain things. They weren't able to eat with certain people like Gentiles, lest they be unclean. But through Christ, they knew that there was just this one new man in the church. It's not Jew. It's not Gentile. We're all one new person in Jesus. And Peter's just enjoying that. But something happens. Look what it says. Go back to verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who have the circumcision. The biggest party pooper in the church is the legalist. Let me be honest. It's the truth. And these very religious brethren from Jerusalem showed up, and they couldn't believe that Peter was eating with the Gentiles. That goes against the law of Moses. Don't you know Gentiles are unclean? They don't keep our ceremonial laws. They don't keep our kosher diet. And the pressure was so great that Peter actually started to abandon the Gentiles. That must have been the most awkward gatherings. Peter stopped eating and hanging out with the Gentiles and would only eat and hang out with the Jews. And this persuasion was so strong, the social pressure that they were feeling, that it says the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with them. So now the rest of the Jews in the church, they get caught up in it too. 
And where there was beautiful unity, now there's division. And not only that, it was so persuasive that even Barnabas, who was Paul's fellow champion of grace for the Gentile church, even he started eating with only the Jews. Now, you might say, Cody, how is that a big deal? This is why it was a big deal. Because when they separated themselves and went back to the law, what they were actually declaring to the Gentiles is you are unclean in God's sight. That's what they were saying to them. We Jews, we're righteous, we're clean, we're acceptable in God's sight, but you're not. If you were, we could eat with you. But because you're not, we can't eat with you. In some ways, some people even argue that that, that's a strong enough statement to say, we're not even sure you're really saved because you don't keep our laws. And you gotta imagine how painful that must have been for the Gentile church. And Paul wasn't gonna have any of it. Look at what it says Paul did. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles, and not as Jews, and not as Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now, I do want to point something out to you guys. A couple things here. Paul intervened when he saw that they were no longer being straightforward about the gospel. And when Paul intervened, he intervened publicly. You might say, well, that goes against Matthew 18. Peter, with his decisions, had led the whole church astray. And it had to be public. Paul had to correct them all at one time and bring the church back together. But this is what I want you to understand from this. When you and I backslide, especially if you're a leader, it hardly ever just affects you. If these brethren had showed up and said, what are you doing, Peter? We're supposed to, all these laws, kosher diet, how can you eat? And he said, you know what, guys? Save it. We all know we're saved by grace. They would have just continued forward. The church of God would have continued in peace. But Peter, as a leader, because he said, well, I don't know, maybe you're right. And it says that he feared them. Do you see that? Paul keeps getting to that theme, fearing man versus fearing God. Peter started to fear man again and not God. And guess what? He started to backslide. And when he backslid, he took all sorts of people with him. And it started to tear the church apart. Don't ever think that when you fall into sin and you backslide, it's just going to affect you. Satan would love to pull you down so that he can bring others down with you. The second thing I want you to notice is Paul's response. Paul intervened. I was just at a conference for Christian leaders, and I, I love this speaker, amazing pastor, but he said, you know what? It's the calling of leaders, of Christian leaders, to confront issues when they happen. If Paul had just sat back and been passive, what would have happened to the whole church? The whole church of Antioch, that beautiful church where people were first called Christians, it would have fallen apart. But Paul knew he had an obligation as a, as a believer, as a leader in God's church to step up and confront the error in love and grace to stand up and confront the heresy. Guys, there are some things in this life worth fighting for. And grace is one of them. The reason I bring that up is because in the church, often we talk about unity. When we start to bicker and fight, we love those passages where Paul says, hey guys, stop it. Like I know there's freedom in perspectives and ideas in church and you and I are to, are to keep the bond of peace through love. But there is a time when you and I are supposed to draw the battle lines and say, no, on this ground, we're gonna fight. And grace is one of them. Paul said, you cannot throw aside God's grace, Peter. You can't do that. You can't look at all these people and say, because they don't keep the laws of Moses, they're not good enough to be saved. And it was through Paul's conviction and boldness as a leader that God turned that situation around. 
Guys, don't be passive. Bad things happen in God's church when his people are passive. The enemies always tried to infiltrate the church. You go read the whole New Testament. There are false teachers everywhere. They multiply like, like cockroaches and they're hard to get rid of. People with weird ideas and doctrines and revelations and variations of the gospel. Paul was always on the lookout for them. And you and I as a church, when that heresy, when those things start to enter our church, it's the mature believers who need to stand up and say, stop, that's not okay. That's not the gospel of Christ. And intervene before it gets out of hand and ruins the good things that God is doing in his body. So Paul stands up to Peter, and this is what he says to him. He says, Peter, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles, what he's saying to him is, Peter, you live with freedom. I know you do. In fact, before these guys came, you were eating with the Gentiles. That's what his hypocrisy was. He pretended to be something he wasn't. He said, Peter, you live like a Gentile and not, as, and not as the Jews. Why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? He goes, Peter, you and I both know that we live under God's grace. So why would you force other people to live under a burden that you yourself can't carry? That's what he says to Peter in front of the whole church. And he continues it and he throws himself in this boat. Verse 15, we, not just Peter, but we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. He looks at Peter and goes, Peter, we, you and me both, who are Jews, grew up our whole lives with the law, and nobody knew the law better than Paul. Paul goes, you and I both know, Peter, that that law would never save you. That's why we needed Jesus in the first place. Guys, my heart's moved for anyone here in our body, or maybe you're on the live stream, who you've started to turn back to legalism, starting to create your own little rituals and your own little system of trying to please God, my heart is moved for you that you would hear Paul's voice right now. When he looked at Peter in the eyes and said, you and I both know, Peter, that those works will never save you. It would never save me. It's the whole reason Jesus came. It's the whole reason we needed him in the first place. Because the law only tells me how bad I am. Because it's God's perfect standard. And by God's perfect standard, we'll never be good enough. And Peter, you know that. And you know there's nothing you could do to ever be good enough. That's why we have believed, verse 16, in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified. That means forgiven. It's like a, it's like a courtroom statement where the judge pardons you. On the day of judgment, when you stand there, the judge pardons you and he says you're justified. That's what it means. He says, Peter, our acceptance, our forgiveness, our pardon has come through our faith in Jesus, and you know that. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Why is that? But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. This is what Paul says about the law in 1 Corinthians. He says this, the letter kills. The law kills, but the Spirit gives life. The old covenant, the law of Moses, it kills you and I spiritually. That's how he died to the law. That's what he means. You and I both know that when the law points its finger at you and me, it condemns you as guilty. It kills you and I. It's only through faith in God that I find life. Verse 17, though, I want us to look back where Paul says, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, are we, our, are we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? This was what the, the Judaizers and these legalistic Christians were bringing. They were saying grace is dangerous. And by the way, it is dangerous because it will change everything about you if you let it. But they said grace is dangerous because there's no more law. So if we say people are forgiven by faith, then they can just go live and do whatever they want. And it's like they're making Jesus a sinner because Jesus is just letting them get away with it. 
And Paul goes, that is not the case at all. If you go back to sin after Christ has forgiven you, that's on you, not Jesus. And not only that, Paul is also alluding to the fact that if you rebuild your works, that you're also a sinner. You might say, oh, I'm so holy because I, I, I'm saved by grace, but I also have all these rules I keep. Paul goes, that's just as much of a sin as just going off and living the way you want to. Because what Paul is getting at is there is a new order in the life of Christians by faith in Christ. Look what he says. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. This is how I died. When I came to faith in Jesus, when the law accused me as a sinner and I turned to Jesus for help and I found a savior, it's like my old man was dealt with on the cross with Jesus. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live then because I died. So my life isn't even about me. For those who say grace is dangerous, you can go live in sin all you want. Paul goes, man, you don't understand grace. Nor do you understand salvation. When I came to Christ, my life became his because I died. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. He goes, you misunderstand. This life is now Jesus' life. This life is Jesus' life. If you are a child of God here today, I'd encourage you to write that down. In your notes, if you're taking them, just say, Lord, my life is yours. My life is yours. The Christian life is not about a faith of knowledge. It's about a faith of committal, a committal faith, a faith where I give myself and surrender to Jesus. And yes, my old man is dealt with, and I experience this newness of life, but this life is for Christ. You might say, well, I'm not sure I want to be a Christian then. The reality is, is you're a slave to someone. I'd much rather be a slave to Christ than a slave to my sin. Because in Christ Jesus, he has set me free. Remember, the gospel message is a message of emancipation. It's a freedom declaration. It's a freedom thing, okay? It's a freedom thing, (laughs) God has declared you and I to be free in Christ through his grace, through his blood. And my life is now brought into this new order where Christ is my king, is Lord of my life, and I no longer live a life that's meant to please man. I live a life to please God. And in that, I find the most joy and satisfaction you will ever find in life. That's where I find it, living for Christ. Goes into that diva I told you guys about, when you and I live a life to give and not to take, well, it's because Christ is alive in you and me. And Christ is a giver. And he wants to use you and I to do great things for others. Great things for his kingdom even. So Paul says, it's no longer I who live. And some of you today, you got to get over that hump. You call yourself a Christian, you want to follow Jesus, but you want to keep living your own way. When you come to Christ, it's no longer you who live, but it's Christ that lives in you. And it's that life of surrender. Lord, my life is yours. And I love what Paul says. I now live in the flesh. I live by faith. Into verse 20, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul goes, and this is why I could entrust and surrender everything to this great king, because this one traded his life for mine, because he loves me. And that's a king worth following. Guys, don't miss the tremendous, great love of Jesus Christ. And as we close this morning, don't miss how personal the gospel was to Paul. Look at what he says. He considers that Jesus loved me, gave himself for me. And I think maybe some of you need to hear that word today. Jesus loves you. He gave himself for you. It wasn't just a corporate thing like Jesus was dying for all these unknown people. He was dying for you by name. That's why Paul could say it's my gospel because Jesus is my Lord. Jesus died for me. Jesus loves me. That's the power of the gospel, that a great God is that personal, that he would reach out to people like you and me to save you and I, to know us by name, to make us friends and children of God. It's a powerful truth. So Paul says to them, this is how he ends his answer to Peter, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. 
Paul goes, for me, I'm not going to set aside God's grace. But the warning is clear. For those who would want to live under law, live by their own good works, Paul says you're setting aside God's grace. Because in so doing, you're claiming that the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, wasn't enough. That's what legalism says at the end of the day. Jesus isn't enough. And Paul says, if you really believe that, then Jesus died in vain. Guys, I think it's a good word. It's a heavy word, but this is a heavy chapter. Don't worry, there's more fun ones ahead. But it's a heavy word for you and I. And worship team, you can come on up. Because for you and I, I need to search my heart. And I need to go, am I setting aside God's grace in any way? As a Christian, am I starting to somehow subtly believe a lie that says that Jesus isn't enough? That I have to earn God's good love again and God's good favor again. And if that's the case, and if I find that to be true, then I need to repent this morning and say, Lord, help me to remember Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. And if you're here today and you're just broken, just broken, maybe you're like, man, I, I call myself a Christian, but I've done things I regret. Let me tell you today, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. His grace is big enough for your failures right where you're at today. And I sure hope there's people here or maybe on the stream who don't know the Lord and you're wrestling in your heart. Am I gonna bow the knee and to surrender to a, a king like this? And we're gonna give you that chance when we take communion. We're gonna give you the chance to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. But if Jesus is calling you today, what are you waiting for? Would you let go of your life, give it to Jesus, and meet the one who loved you and gave himself for you? Find God's forgiveness, find his salvation, find friendship with the Lord. Through faith, you don't have to do anything weird or wonky. You just gotta say, Lord Jesus, save me. Let's pray. Lord, we're just so, um, so grateful for your tremendous grace, God, that is so good, that never uh, leads us astray and it never leaves us. And God, I just pray as a church, Lord, that, um, that we would hear your heart, Father, as our shepherd. God, you love us so much. You don't want us to live under legalism. You don't want us to live under bondage and ritualism because, Lord, you died to set us free. You died that we have a newness of life in you, God. You rose from the dead to give us a new resurrected, powerful life through you, Jesus. And God, not only that, but you've given us your grace to live in your freedom and to represent you and be the aroma of your son, Jesus, to this world. And God, when we live in legalism, we lose that. So Lord, as a church, I pray we would be a people of grace, Father. That, you, that through your grace, your son Jesus would be revealed in us and through us to our world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna go ahead and worship. If you'd like to take communion this morning, go ahead, raise your hand up. The ushers are coming around. They'll bring you communion right where you're sitting. Hold on to it though, because we're gonna partake together this morning.